Josh, you said we wanted to do precision rifle shooting today. You did not specify the era. And now I'm punished. <laughs> <laughs> with the motion. I'm doing the shooting. What do you mean you're being punished? You, you're enjoying the glory of the Red Army. You ready? 300? Yeah. Alright, I'm on the okay. So, you hear a lot about Soviet snipers. Which ones do you know? I know Vasily. Okay. Thank you, American pop culture. Everyone knows Vasily thanks to Enemy at the Gates, and he does not look like Jude Law. I know... Tiger Shaman, because you were Tiger Shaman in the Mosin video. Now, now it's not Tiger Shaman, no, it's, it's Tiger. tiger. No, Tiger. <laughs> like two lamb and his tiger. Okay. So, I wanted to set things up to talk a little bit about... Impact. Russian snipers, or Soviet snipers in the Second World War, and some of their uh, contributions and backgrounds to it. Because I feel like a lot of people in America, when you talk to them, about Soviet snipers. It's like maybe one, Vasily Zaitsev, and fictional snipers like Rachel Weiss come to their mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, American pop culture has done its best work. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, female snipers were a thing. Absolutely, that was a thing in the Soviet Union. Partially because they were trying to maximize the resources that they had. Because if you open a population up to the female population as well to serve, all of a sudden you double the population that you could draw from. That's some good math you just that, did indeed. there. Indeed. Is that uh, is that that Asian math? <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think a lot of times it's kind of it's kind of crazy for us nowadays. You talk about women in combat arms. I when I was in the military women were not in combat arms. Yeah, it's a big controversy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. still, I'd say it's still somewhat controversial, right? There's a lot of, like, at least shade thrown around at the PT standards and mm -hmm. stuff like that, yeah. But when push comes to shove, when your country is, like, getting taken over, I guess it doesn't matter what PT standards are, there's, right? There's a bit of a luxury in that, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. But, so, I wanted to start and talk about Ludmila Pavlachenko. Have you ever heard of that name? No. Partially, I'm I'm guessing. Hold on. Dead on. Ah, he, the major has been found. Uh, partially, I, I'm wondering because in Enemy at the Gates, there's that one scene. You remember the department store? How unfulfilling is it in Enemy of the Gates that like the final kill shot on the Major is at like point blank range? Oh, I, I know, I know. <laughs> Alright, sorry. Anyways, Lud Ludmilla, the department Ludmilla store. Pavlachenko, she was a, uh, like a, tw she was a 24 year old college student when the war came to her. She was Ukrainian. And uh, a lot of times when they, when people talk about female snipers in the Soviet Union, Lubyla Pavlachenko, her name comes up, but the image of Rosa Shanina comes up. We'll talk about her in a bit. But when you're looking at some of these guys who were snipers, they all came from a civilian background. Obviously, you don't, you're not born, even in the Soviet Union, you're not born in a sign that you shall be a sniper later on. And one thing that I've learned is that they all have backgrounds w that put them in a position to where they learn how to they learn how to shoot. They don't learn how to shoot when they're in the military. They bring it to the military. Mm. And Ludmila Pavlachenko, so she was a 24 year old college student. She kind of grew up like a little bit of a tomboy. But so the story goes that at one point, she, when she was playing sports and doing all the activities with all the other like local boys. One of them challenged her and said that he could outshoot anyone. So she ended up joining the shooting club and getting really, really good at shooting and just outshoot, outshot everyone and basically told them to shove off. Uh, but then later on, she ended up, when, when her school was bombed, 
and she ceased to become a college student because of her school ceasing to exist, uh, she started working in a state arsenal, making small arms, and she was a lathe turner. And so she ended up being very familiar with firearms, not only from shooting, but also working in the industry mm. in Russia, right? Okay. During her time in the industry, the, the factories also had courses, military courses for people. So you could learn aviation, you could learn all sorts of stuff. And, and sniper and shooting courses were a part of that. And so in um, the early days of the war, when they started opening up for females to join the uh, Red Army, she volunteered to be a sniper. It, so early that they did still didn't have female sniper courses. Uh. It was it, she went in as a single female soldier into like a sea of male snipers going through the course. And so she's kind of singled out. Like one thing I learned in in the military when you're going through basic, you don't want to be that one guy who's like special. But in this case, this is like as special as you can get it, right? Yeah. Uh, so she went through, and of course, she had been shooting competition her whole her whole life, and her shooting skills were impeccable. And she was able to show that off even as a rookie. And she ended up in the Battle of Odessa, and then later on in Sevastopol, and racking up three hundred and nine kills. Three hundred and nine. Three hundred and nine kills Holy as a cow. sniper. A lot of that came down to her field craft and improvising and trying new tactics to lure snipers in. Like she she has interviews where she talks about like the rookies, they would they would have them go out on hunter teams. So a shooter sniper combo and they would they would watch a sector and just take high value targets from the Germans. And then she was also pioneering some counter sniper operations with five teams of five to seven snipers oh, wow. and they would go out and hunt German snipers in these engagements. But the cool thing about what she did wasn't just about sniping because she later on she she ended up with a with enough shrapnel that they, she could not serve anymore. Okay. And when she was in hospital the Soviet VA had determined that of course her injuries were not service related and uh sent her on her way into doing other things. And one of those things that was kind of interesting, because at this point she was nicknamed Lady Death in the front, and she she had a little bit of a, a celebrity status going on in the Soviet Union. And the Soviets, they were fighting the, the Germans, and they were having a hard time. Uh, well, obviously they were having a hard time because it was just... <laughs> the Soviets out there fighting the Germans alone on the Eastern Front. Stalin and Roosevelt had been wanting to get the American side to open up a second front. But of course, when it comes to opening up a second front, America isn't like Russia where the person in charge could just say, let's send all the troops over here and open up a second front. It takes a, an act of Congress. Or it used to. Well, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but uh, Roosevelt needed public support in order to get American troops to get into the European front to fight. And so she was actually sent over to America. Ah, a good bit of uh, propaganda. Yeah, yeah, yeah poli a little bit of politics. A little bit of advertisement. Huh? Yeah, so, so she ended up going on a public tour with Eleanor Roosevelt. FDR's wife. Oh, interesting. And learning about how to talk to the American public. And then, of course, you're talking about, like, a tomboy college girl who gave no craps about how to do public speaking trying to engage the public, the American press. And, like, nowadays... After having been retired from combat. Yeah, from I know. Injuries sustained with hundreds of kills. Yeah. Yeah. 309 kills. And he, she's trying to talk to... Americans in, in Russian uh, about how how the front was and how it was going. Sure. Как русский солдат, я предлагаю вам великим солдатам Америки свою руку. Fellow soldiers, forward to victory. And so, instead of being interested in her exploits, though, they were more interested in how she looked. They're like. Ludmilla, why why is your dress so long and why does it look so ugly? Impact. 
Meanwhile, that was her uniform <laughs> that she freaking wore. And they were asking, well, would you wear makeup in the front lines? Like Classic. absolute things that were, you, know, you could tell that they were so detached from reality. You know, this the, the realities that they lived in were so different. And so Eleanor Roosevelt taught her how to essentially tell them to go eat uh, during the interviews uh, while, you know, elegantly telling them to go eat shit and inspiring uh, people to, uh, to listen to her story. And you could say that her contributions or her politicking actually brought America over onto the European front because then that gradually built up some of the support mm. for Congress. So one of the initial catalysts? Yeah. Interesting. But um, then there was another sniper that, that I think my appearance is perhaps... Well, you mentioned, who is it, Rosa Shanino, whose yeah. photo comes up? That's not your you never, likeness. Have you heard of Rosa Shanina? Well, you mentioned her earlier. And so I could talk about Rosa back. Shanina, yeah. But then she, you said your likeness. You look like one. I of don't them. look like Rosa Shanina. Oh, okay. Rosa Shanina is a pretty girl. And quite frankly, she also got propagandized quite a bit because of that. Yeah, Rosa Shanina, she was a 20-year-old sniper um, out of the northern part of Russia. Her family, they were poor, but she had three adopted siblings who were orphans outside of the six biological siblings that, that she had. So she was from a blended family, uh, and she had a heart for orphans and, and young children. Uh, she was a kindergarten teacher, but during her time becoming a kindergarten teacher, she actually grew up very poor and had to walk all over the place. like. 20 clicks to school and 20 clicks back. Like, so like that old adage where you're like, oh, back in my day, I had to walk 20 clicks uphill and 20 clicks uphill the other side to oh, yes. come home. That was her, like she actually had to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but then when the war came to her in Russia, uh, let's do a little closer, the cleaner target one. How 250? <laughs> Impact, dead center. Uh, she, uh, the kindergarten she was working at got firebombed <laughs> and so she was trying to protect the kids and then at the same time one of her two of her brothers two of her brothers got killed uh, one of them in Leningrad and then the other one near her Fyodor who she was living with back then um, so she had a burning desire to become someone on the front to uh, frontline troops and she was already a bit of a rebel because she she like disobeyed her parents okay so military life, I mean, if, if this is foreshadowing, uh, military life is all about following orders. Right. She wanted to become a sniper, which typically has a lot of latitude in the front lines uh, to operate alone or in small units. Um, so she did become a sniper. After pushing, 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 she did become a sniper. And on her way of becoming a sniper, she actually joined a... Uh, she, she learned how to shoot at a local shooting club before she went into sniper school mm. and um, she ended up commanding a sniper platoon once she got in. Impact, right half. Right side. A female sniper platoon when she got in because this was 43 and she actually used a PU sniper like this one mm. rather than a PEM. Once she was in though, the war, it wasn't winding down per se, so late GWAT guys will understand this you join the war thinking ah, i want to i want to do my part i want to fight i want to go and deploy and then you realize well all the all the glory stories and all that deployment stuff is like the surge 2007 era type of type of stories or i mean if you really wanted to experience fallujah which i don't think anyone joined saying i want to be in fallujah uh, that that style of fighting was already just not there by the time I joined the military. Yep. The, there still was fighting, it just wasn't there. And so this was post-Stalingrad when she joined and, and the Red Army was already advancing towards okay. the, the Prussian territory. And her unit was ended up in East Prussia. But the snipers were, were told to be held back because the Russians didn't want to bleed any more of their sniper uh, sniper experts in the field. Okay. 
uh, understandably. So they were just pushing a lot of the foot soldiers into the point. Well, is this like the point where they're they're making like a strong yeah this re was assault towards yeah this was pushing Germany. into Poland and okay, East yeah. Prussia into uh, Lithuania specifically okay. Vilnius uh, where where she was. Um, she ended up with a fifty nine kill count, fifty nine kills. It's also ridiculous in a short couple months in the front. Unfortunately. She did get killed uh, by indirect fire. Mm. Um, the enemy of the sniper. Yeah, yeah. But the the interesting thing is, like, whenever she got her kill counts, she was like AWOL. She went AWOL to go to the front to fight oh, wow. with the, the 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 guys in the front. And through that, she racked up her fifty nine kills. Wow. And those are confirmed kills. Those are not including unconfirmed kills. Um, but the also the interesting thing is, she she kept a diary. So kind of like, for the audience out there, diaries are actual books that you write in, kind of like social media, but other people don't see it until you die. <laughs> so her diary became published, it was published, and it became a thing that people were able to learn about this one female sniper in the front, because she was also pretty. So, so they took photos of her for propaganda purposes, and the Canadians also wrote about her. She became famous when she was in, but her diary, when they when they published it, they realized that she, you know a lot of the things that she was talking about in the back end, and a lot of the aspirations that she had. She wanted to open an orphanage after the war. She wanted to take in kids who were separated from so she parents. wrote all this in the diary she wrote all of this in her diary oh, it's like a propagandist's uh perfect situation yeah i yeah. mean it, it is but she's also a 20 year old who kept on going awol to fight in the front it's an interesting uh interesting breed of person for sure yeah so i wanted to add just a little bit right here because i think that diaries and first person accounts like this are very important for us to learn as human beings, um, even years down the road. Because especially in Rosa Shanina's case, she writes about her life aspirations. She writes about friends that she's made and friends that she grieves because she lost them during war. Uh, she talks about falling in love and losing her love interests as a casualty of war. She talks about very real wartime emotions like fear. While some of these diaries and autobiographies have a tendency of being altered by propaganda, in Rosa's particular case, she even talks about Red Army senior officers making unwanted sexual advances towards her. Now, this may not be a definitive uh, indication, but I, I, I don't think Red Army propaganda would be releasing this type of information out there willingly. At the end, though, I think literature like this could be important for us as human beings to grow. And uh, quite frankly, it's something that our channel being very heavy on the technical shooting side and historical side, we, we don't get to talk about these human interactions very frequently. So I thought that was pretty cool. Back to the show. So then um, I think, let's see, are we on the 500 yard? You can go 450. 450. Just to the base of the flagpole. Uh, dial in a little bit. We've got some wind today. The 450 is a decently long distance shot for snipers back then. I'll hold base. On glass. Impact dead center. Nice. Do another one. Impact. Nice. Oh. These so, rounds are two inches from each other. Sick. Nice. So the um, so 450 for back then that was a pretty long shot. Yeah. You know, a lot of them, especially if you're talking about Stalingrad, they were working in like really short distances, like you know 200 and in. The reason the Russians and and Rosa also talks about this in her diary, and so, so did Ludmila Pavlichenko. Uh, they valued the expert snipers more. They valued not giving up their positions more and patience more than anything. And so when they were doing counter sniper operations, they would lay there for three days sometimes, letting the Germans do all their bait and everything and think they're not there. And then finally shoot them 
at a long distance wow. whenever they whenever they finally broke cover. And so field craft was a premium for, for these guys. But I am going to close my optics right now because the next guy I want to talk about is the Taiga Shaman, not the Tiger Shaman, Josh. Semyon Namokano. It's interesting because when you look at pictures of this guy, he's like this short Mongolian descent indigenous Russian. He's from the, the Transbaikal region, so he looks more like me than he does you. Yeah. He, he is not white at all. So when he showed up at his unit, and he showed up as a, in the funeral detail unit. Okay. 41 years old. Old dude. Yep. Short little Asian uncle. And he didn't speak Russian. Like, he only knew things like lunchtime. So he thought, oh, this is like some from the, you know. You can't say that anymore, Henry. Okay, That's so not politically correct. It's, it's like this not very smart person uh, out there in the Far East who doesn't even understand the language. And they just gave him what you would give a funeral detail soldier. Just menial work. Yeah. So until one day, he, they, they came under fire and he picked up like a Mosin Nagant rifle. Target? 300. Impact. With iron sights, he started shooting at all these Germans at distance like that. And they were like, what? <laughs> what? Hold up, hold on. This Asian uncle knows how to shoot. <laughs> of course the dude was a hunter. Ah. And, and I'm specifically in honor of Se Semyon Namokhanov. I'm using soft points for these <laughs> because he was a hunter. <laughs> so he's a hunter. He was a, um, a hunter from the Transbaikal region who started shooting since he was seven years old. Oh, wow. And so you translate that, seven to 41, like that's a lot of years for someone to have behind a rifle. Sure. And they would give him scoped rifles and he would be like, no, I, I, don't, I don't want that. I, I want iron sights. Kind of like a certain Finn that we know of. I mean, or you. Uh, <laughs> so, Nomokhanov ended up with 367 confirmed kills. I mean, it's just so wild by today's standards. Like, can you imagine that type of a kill? Like, 367? I, yeah, I mean... With what is, iron what sights, is, by what the way. They, what iron did, sight kills. I, I, yes, I, I, it's crazy. Like, what are modern snipers? Like, what did Chris Kyle 50 is record? a pretty high number. Right, yeah. Like, it's... <laughs> yeah, that, it's just completely different. Like, just, it's a different world. But yeah, I would crazy. also say, let's let's put it this way. Um, Simo Hawa yeah. had a lot more kills. He also had a lot more targets to shoot at. Sure. Whereas yeah. nowadays, snipers don't have that many targets to yeah, shoot yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot more rules. Well, talking about ours, there's a lot more rules that go into it. Sure, but, right. Uh, you want to do another iron sight one? Sure. You three again? Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll glass. Impact. Nice. Left half. So, um... They realized that, oh, this guy can shoot, and they gave him snipe, a sniper rifle, and he was like, no, 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 no. I don't want these iron sights. No, I only want I don't want, want these, these optics. I only want iron sights. <laughs> and uh, of his 367 kills, Josh, uh, eight of them were Japanese. How does that even happen? Because he fought on both sides. Wow. Because remember, Russia was also with war. In, in what? In, in war in, with Japanese. Was it on the border? Like Korea, China? And Mongolia, China. Yeah, okay. So the dude was born in 1900. Like, wow. not the 1900s. The, on the button. 1900. Wow. So uh, he ended up getting wounded like eight or nine times. Like, old, old uncle from Siberia would not die. Just continue keep, to live. Just keeps going. Continue to shoot. He was a quiet dude. So he used to smoke a pipe and and every kill he would he would get he would put a notch on his pipe and not on his rifle. I would imagine get like maybe like 20 that kind of fills up one side of the stem. My goodness. <laughs> maybe 20 on the other side, but like 357 he probably ceased to do that on his pipe yeah, at some it's point. Crazy. 
So I was able to find a picture of the Taiga Shaman's actual pipe. And you'll see that he didn't do hashes, he did dots. And I also learned that he specifically made marks on his pipe because he didn't want to deface his rifle. Uh, because he didn't want to deface, one, he didn't want to uh, be punished for destroying government property. But two, uh, he didn't want his officers to take his rifle away from him so he would lose his scoreboard. This guy is metal. But back to the show. The dude lived. After getting wounded eight or nine times and fathered nine children, of which he has had 49 grandchildren by the time he died. Wow. Uh, he went back to his village and became a village elder and continued on to lead his local community in that area. Wow. So, impact. The spirit of the Taiga Shaman lives. Crazy. So what's the overarching theme here? That, that in, in the time where you know, it wasn't about who was "quote unquote" like signing up, right? Like everybody was involved. It yeah. was a, it was a, it was a required all of, effort. All right? of these. There's not a lot that's written about Semyon because he was a pretty quiet dude. Yeah. And he also didn't speak a lot of Russian. Yeah. I believe he was drafted. Okay. Into like he was doing funeral details. That sounds like a draft. A draft position. Yeah. Um, but what was the uni the unifying theme here? Is that they they. A All lot of the, you'll see a lot of these guys, and, and we didn't talk about Vasily. Vasily also was a hunter. Yeah, from from young, um, these guys don't become snipers from sniper school. Mm. Ludmila Pavlachenko was a sports shooter and a gunsmith at the, at the state arsenal. Um, Rosa Shanina was she was she wasn't a big time sports shooter, but she learned to shoot at a sports shooting club locally. Uh, Vasily was a hunter. Namakhanov was also a hunter. Yeah. All of these guys learned to shoot on their own. And the hunting and sports shooting communities, and they bring that into the military. It's not guys who go in the military and go through sniper school and magically have this skill. Mm. And on top of that, these they're successful because these hunters, they understand camouflage. They understand field craft. They learn these things. Ludmila Pavlichenko learned that from a hunter when she was working in the front with a local hunter. She learned field craft from them. Interesting. So all of these things, the, a lot of what snipers do nowadays, yes, a lot of it was learned from the baptism of fire during World War II by the Russian snipers, but a lot of it predating that came from the civilian sportsman mentality. Mm. And honestly, those are the best shots that I saw in the military too. When you served. Yeah. yeah. Country boys who like to shoot on their own. <laughs> Those are the people I learned to shoot from. Yeah. Country boys who shot CMP competitions, yeah. iron sights. You remember back then in college, I used to hang out with that crowd. Yeah. And so when it comes to it, I think, I think a lot of times people in the military kind of poo-poo on sports shooting and hunting but those out those guys out there that's those are the guys who carried the torch back in the day and still continue to do so interesting all right what do you say it's cold guys till next time see you on the eastern front wait <laughs> Продолжение следует...